Hi, I'm Renee Coble. I'm producing artistic director for Tennessee Rep. And um, I, thanks so much to Gail for her kind words and also big congratulations to Kristen on the baby. We're all so excited about that. Um, I think that uh, what we're going to do here for you is we're going to have a little uh, a chat here, a little background about the play, and then we're going to show you a couple of scenes and you'll get uh, an opportunity to learn a little bit about this spectacular play, sometimes called the funniest play ever written in the English language, and for good reason. Um, when Tennessee Rep is deciding on a season, we have a lot of things that we take into account, not the least of which is what are some plays we really want to work on. <laughs> And so when we're balancing the, um, the kind of program we do, we do a lot of contemporary uh, com comedies and dramas, um, and we do musicals and that sort of thing. But every once in a while, you really want to sink your teeth into some really delicious classic, and The Importance of Being Earnest is a great example of that. The reason I chose to put The Importance of Being Earnest on our season this year is because it's fun. Every once in a while, you just got to do something that's fun. Fun. Now, what's cool about it is, and I think some of these uh, ladies sitting beside me will uh, elaborate more on that, is that it's also somewhat of a social commentary, and there's a lot of uh, sort of meat underneath all the sugar, but it's this delicious confection of language, and um, it is a most ridiculous romantic comedy, and it's a great deal of fun for us to work on it. Um, the actors uh, relish the opportunity to uh, utilize those words. Uh, the dialogue is sparkling and, and delicious. I keep using the word delicious when I talk about this play a lot because it just is. It's like tasty. You just want to roll it around in your mouth. Um, and it's also um, a lovely challenge for um, the technical staff that we have at Tennessee Rep because it's set, it's a Victorian, it's set in, the, in 1895, London, England. So that Victorian era has a really cool quality to it when you're talking about costumes, you're talking about fabulous dresses with corsets. You'll see our actresses over here actually wearing corsets because I don't know if you know this, but when you're wearing a corset, things change for your body. <laughs> you can't really breathe the same way, stand the same way, sit the same way. So we rehearse in them from the very beginning. Um, and then of course scenically, this play is often a challenge um, uh, to do because it has three separate locations and so you're talking about three completely different um, rooms. Um, and so uh, finding a way to solve that and make that happen um, is a challenge that my uh, resident scenic designer Gary Hoff um, was really excited about getting to do. So when you come to see The Importance of Being Earnest, and you all will, I'm sure, um, you will actually be inundated with sort of this joyous uh, theatrical experience. Costumes, scenery, spectacular language, wonderful acting. So um, it's really uh, as much of a joy for us to do it as it is for an audience to receive it. So frankly, that's sort of why it's on the season. <laughs> um, I'm going to pass the uh, mic here to the lady to my left. My, no, that'd be my right. <laughs> Here, Keep passing. Keep passing. <laughs> no. All right. I. Um, oh, hello. My name is Elizabeth Covington, and I'm going to give you some biographical information about Oscar Wilde, the playwright. Um, he lived from 18, um, 1854 to 1900. Um, he was enormously successful as a writer. He wrote novels, he wrote poems, he wrote critical works, but he was most successful as a dramatist. Um, and that actually is in keeping with his personality because he was no shrinking violet. He um, was a consummate actor, um, and in fact, is known around was known around London because he. Um, this was a time of male sartorial drabness, sort of a late Victorian black on black um, approach to fashion. Um, and he would wear velvet knee breeches and a green carnation in his buttonhole. So he was famous for um, having exciting dress. Um, he uh, was, he went into, he was put in prison for homosexuality when he, in 1895 and he was there for two years and when he emerged from prison he was uh, impoverished and actually he moved to Paris and he died um, there in 1900, um, still basically impoverished. So it's a very sad end to his life but the importance of being earnest was sort of his last great success because it was put on in 1895 um, and it ran for a record 86 uh, 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 iterations. Uh, there were 86 performances before um, actually the play stopped being performed because um, he went into prison. It was published in 1899 though and has been revised and um, re reprised um, many times ever since. Hi, 
My name is Kristen Essen, and uh, I teach in the theater department at Vanderbilt University. And uh, I just taught this play last week to my, uh, I teach a, a 100 level uh, fundamentals of theater class, which is essentially um, teaching these students about the way in which theater is uh, not just something that we go to, but is a, it's a part of our culture. And this is just one of those uh, canonical text that that speaks to uh, amateurs as well as professionals I think so uh, some of these students who were grappling with this text last last week in my classroom um, this was maybe one of the first times that they stood up uh, and embodied a character on stage and um, What's so lovely about Wilde's language is that it gives even the amateur actor so many clues in terms of, of this style. I, I kind of sort of think of the language as a kind of corset, um, that as soon as you start speaking the language, things happen in your body. So uh, in my class, I, I gave my students just very quick, what, one of the things we were talking about was uh, what a director does. And I gave them uh, beats of action, which are just a couple of lines of dialogue in a scene in which you can see each of the actors wanting something very clearly, and usually wanting something from the other person. And they had to clarify what the, what the action was in that beat. And I made them choose very direct actions. That's the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. To get the actor to yeah, know. I it's it's not that. just that I'm trying to get you to like me, right? It's I'm slapping you across the face and knocking you to the ground. Or so, uh, and of course, I have 10 football players in my class. So I made them do <laughs> Do these actions in slow motion, I said, because <laughs> they're huge. I don't know if you've been to the games, but <laughs> these are very large men. <laughs> um, and I adore them quite a lot. Um, and so I had them um, embodying these actions and then telling them to, to bury the action in the dialogue. And uh, some of these very large men uh, played beautifully Lady Bracknell and um, <laughs> Algernon and because of course that's exactly what I did was give the largest one the, the Lady Bracknell so <laughs> when you see the defensive lineman coming down and you can just imagine that uh, but this is this is absolutely one of those texts that speaks to um, to our love of theater because a lot of of what I'm trying to do is really teach um, this younger generation um, to be um, lovers of the stage and, and to be you guys, um, to, to be subscribers to um, Tennessee Rep that does such wonderful work for the national community. Yay, so how would you like to see a little scene from this delicious play, yes? Okay, so first we're going to bring you a scene that cu that's in Act 1. Um, and uh, there's some information you need to know before you see this. Uh, the play opens, uh, we get to know two young men, two young men about London who are friends, um, Algernon and Ernest, although we soon learn it is revealed that the young man calling himself Ernest is actually not really called Ernest. His real name is John, or Jack for short, right? Um, and he describes why he is Ernest in the city and Jack in the country. He has a country house where there lives a pretty young ward that he's responsible for and so whenever he wants to go play in the city he pretends that he has a brother in, the, in town who continually gets into scrapes and so he has to go help his brother Ernest um, and then when he's in town uh, he actually assumes the name of Ernest. That's logical, right? You would do that. All right, so um, for all the people and friends that he has in the city, they believe that his name is Ernest, and it, that includes the young woman that uh, he is in love with, and her name is Gwendolyn. She is Algernon's cousin and also daughter to Lady Bracknell, who is a lady of some social standing and um, opinion. Um, so what uh, we're going to bring to you now is uh, uh, in Act 1, when uh, Algernon has contrived to get Lady Bracknell out of the room so that Jack will have the opportunity to propose to Gwendolyn. So playing Gwendolyn for us is Emily Landum, playing Jack is Eric Pasto Crosby, and when Lady Bracknell arrives that will be Rona Carter. So this, here we are, scene one, the proposal. 
Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray, don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. <laughs> I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to, take, uh, to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. Well, I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any other girl I have ever met since I met you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I am quite well aware of the fact, and I often wish that, in public at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. Ernest, my own Ernest. But you I don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. <laughs> but your name is Ernest. <laughs> yes, I know it is. But supposing it was something else. Do you mean to tell me you couldn't love me then? Oh, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. <laughs> Personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care about the name of Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say that I think there are lots of mothers much nicer names. I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. <laughs> Jack! No! <laughs> there is very little music to the name Jack, if any at all. Indeed, it does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. <laughs> I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John. And I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. And the only really safe name is Ernest. <laughs> Gwendolyn, I must be christened at once. I, I mean, we must get married at once. Married, Mr. Worthy? Uh, well, clearly, you know that I love you, Gwendolyn, and you led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, that you are not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you. But you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable idea. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. <laughs> Gwendolyn! Yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you got to say to me? <laughs> You know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it! <laughs> <laughs> Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long you have been about it. I'm afraid you've had very little experience in how to propose. <laughs> My own one? I have never loved anyone in the world but you. Yes, but men often propose for practice. <laughs> I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They're quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that, especially when there are other people present. Mr. Worthing, rise, sir, for this semi-recumbent posture. It's most indecorous. <laughs> Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, 
Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, but you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come upon a girl as a surprise. <laughs> Pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be, it is hardly a matter that she could be allowed to arrange for herself. And now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. And while I'm making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! In the carriage, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn! Yes, Mama. Carriage. <laughs> You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you're not on my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I'm quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes. I must admit, I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. Man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Uh, Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I've always been of opinion that a man who desires to get married should either know everything or nothing. <laughs> Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bragnall. <laughs> I'm pleased to hear it. <laughs> I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. <laughs> the whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England at any rate, Education produces no effect whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, if it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes. Probably leads to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. <laughs> what is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties extracted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure, gives one position, and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it, about 1,500 acres, I believe. I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only ones who make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Wendon could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is to let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like, six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. <laughs> oh, uh, she goes about very little. Uh, she is a lady considerably advanced in years. Oh! Nowadays, there is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. <laughs> the unfashionable side. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? <laughs> Both, if necessary, if I presume. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us or come in the evening at any rate. No, to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. <laughs> to lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? 
I'm afraid I don't, really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I lost my parents. It would be nearer to the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I, I was, well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Uh, Worthing is a place in Sussex. It's a seaside resort. Where did this charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for the seaside resort find you? In a handbag. <laughs> a handbag? <laughs> yes. Lady Bracknell, I was in a handbag, a somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it. <laughs> An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James of Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line? is immaterial, Mr. Worthing. <laughs> I confess, I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it has handles or not, <laughs> seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. <laughs> and I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, has indeed been probably used for that purpose before now. But it hardly can be regarded as an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys, that was lovely. We've been in rehearsal for less than a week, so I think they're really what? knocking it out of the park, right? <laughs> and uh, the only comment I would add to that, uh, I, I wanted to follow up a little bit. What uh, Kristen said is literally the language has been, um, is a clue. We spent a lot of time in rehearsal um, sort of thinking about it as the, the mystery to be unlocked. As soon as you understand how that language flows, you just learn so much about the characters and what they're about. So I think that's demonstrated when you hear the play read. Yeah. Comments? I'm just reminded again so much of how playful, too, the language is. And uh, uh, to re reference back to you, delicious. Mm -hmm. And um, I, love, I love the choice of having uh, Lady Bracknell completely in charge. I mean, she is the queen of this domestic sphere. Uh, wherever they are in this play, she comes in and uh, it, it's like the king coming into the theater. Everything stops while everyone just <laughs> turns to Lady Bracknell. Um, and to have her just completely um, sitting while he, he stands mm -hmm. at attention um, almost has a military feel to it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because you see that Gwendolyn is just a barely veiled version of Lady Bracknell. She, <laughs> give her a year and she will be her mother. I also wanted to, to point out that um, it's interesting because when this play was originally pr performed and then afterwards, some people have a hard time with the humor in it mm -hmm. because it is, it is very humorous. But like, for example, George Bernard Shaw said that the wit in this and the play was sinister. <laughs> and um, because it does get right at the heart of a lot of the pretenses that we use in the interactions that people have with one another. Uh, and so it can be almost sort of unsettling. And sometimes, uh, like when I teach it, my students find it a little bit unsettling to, uh, to actually perform some of these scenes because it's sort of uncanny. It's a little too, hits too close to home at times. Well, it, it was a very pointed comedy, and uh, mm -hmm. the, the subtitle, the, the Trivial Comedy for Serious People, in an earlier draft, it was a serious comedy for trivial people. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he, I mean, Wilde was really breaking it down for his Victorian audience, and uh, he, was, he was pointing out their social code, whether they... Uh, took it upon themselves to be uh, 
the, the figure of ridicule or not, uh, the, the, a part of the part of the comedy is being able to laugh at this very strict social code that we live under. And it was incredibly strict, as you can imagine, at that time. We spent quite a bit of time in rehearsal um, exploring what some of the rules were of the day. I mean, they had rules about every possible social interaction, rules about how to make introductions, rules about how to shake hands or not shake hands, rules about what, uh, uh, what your calling card should look like and how th that whole process of paying calls on people had a very certain and very particular structure to it. And so there's so much structure to every, uh, every social interaction, not the least of which is how do you get married. So that whole courting thing had a whole, uh, a whole series of rules about it. Um, and so it was, it's fun for us to sort of look at how Oscar Wilde is, um, it, you know, is sort of blowing that up a little. He, he presents it and then shows how ridiculous it is. But yet he was also a darling of that very, you know, those people that he's making fun of, he was also making his living off of them. <laughs> So it's a tricky place for him to be. Um, but, but we found it was really interesting that in asking the question, why is it still funny? Mm -hmm. um, that it has to do with, so that it, I think it's somewhere in there, that the idea that there, we get all caught up in structure and, uh, um, and that the rules are the answer. And sometimes it's not about the rules, it's about being people and feeling for real instead of having a structure that represents real feelings, right? And so there, that's true even today. Anytime there's a... There's a structure that sort of takes over, even if it was created for a good reason, but then it becomes the end all instead of, you know, what, you know, what it's supposed to, to um, uh, make happen. Like we were talking about um, the Elizabeth rules about, about introductions or about making sure everybody yeah. was respectful to each other, and that's all a good thing, but then when it becomes the thing by which you get judged, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, be it becomes a weapon against you if you don't follow the rules exactly the right way, and, and, I th and that's still true. I mean, we still relate to that in so many ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, go ahead. Oh, were you? I was just going to say, Elizabeth and I were talking uh, before this panel about one of the exercises that she led in class about the structures that we live under. Yeah, what I did was for, for some of my students when I was having them, we were, we were studying the importance of being earnest and we were talking about the, 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 the scene where um, uh, Jack is proposing to Gwendolyn and they wanted to understand exactly why she insisted on him, even after they had admitted their mutual affection, to go ahead and do the proposal, why that was such a big deal. And so I had them rewrite the entire relationship through Facebook status posts. <laughs> Um, and they started to understand at that point because they, they, understand, they understood, it's like, oh, okay, when you first meet somebody, you post certain kinds of things to talk about, oh, I just met somebody I like, or now I'm dating somebody I like, all the way up to um, that status post when you have gotten married. And so they were able to do that, and it, suddenly it all made sense to them um, the, when they started to see the way those structures were actually operating in their own lives. That was, again, one of the places where the humor started to maybe get mm -hmm. a little too close for comfort mm -hmm. at times, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we have another scene that we will uh, read for you now, and this one is from uh, Act Two. Um, playing uh, Cecily is Marin Miller, and playing Algernon is Jacob York. So here's what you need to know to understand what's going on here. When um, Jack was uh, creating this fictional brother called Ernest that lives in the city uh, and would tell his um, pretty young ward in the country about his brother Ernest. She found him rather uh, appealing and you know she kind of liked that bad boy thing going on, right? So he had decided he needs to, you know, kind of deal with that and, and really wanted to make sure after he told Algernon about his pretty young ward that Algernon didn't meet her because he wanted to take care of her virtue and all that sort of stuff. Well, Algernon gets this great idea. He decides he wants to meet Cecily, so he, unbeknownst to his uh, friend Jack, goes to Jack's house in the country and poses as the brother Ernest and tells Cecily that he is Ernest. And so... Um, they have a mutual attraction that starts up, and um, what you'll be seeing is the scene where they, uh, it's, a, it's the second proposal that happens in this play. So, here we go. I hope, Cecily, I shall not offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. <laughs> I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. <laughs> if you will allow me, I will copy remarks into my diary. Oh, do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. Oh, no. 
You see, it is simply a, a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. <laughs> <laughs> well, it appears in volume form. I hope you will order a copy. Uh, but pray, pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. <laughs> I am quite ready for more. <coughs> <coughs> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. Cecily, <laughs> ever since I first looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Oh, I don't, I don't think you should tell me that you, that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly. Hopelessly. <laughs> Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily. Hmm? The dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come around next week at the same time. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew that you were staying on till next week at the same hour. I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anybody else in the world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? Oh, you silly boy! Of course! <laughs> <laughs> Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. Engaged for the last three months? Yes. We'll be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? <laughs> well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad. You, of course, have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And, of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. It seems that there must be something in him, after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but... I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling, but when was our engagement actually settled? <laughs> On the 14th of February last. Oh. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I had determined to end the matter one way or the other. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day, I bought this little ring in your name. <laughs> And this is the bangle with the true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. Did I give you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? <laughs> yes. You have wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given you for leading such a bad life. Oh, and this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. <laughs> my letters? But my own sweet Cecily, I've never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. <laughs> I remember only too well I was forced to write your letters for you. <laughs> I wrote always three times a week, and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, no. They would make you far too conceited. <laughs> the three you wrote me after I had broken off our engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was, on the 22nd of March. You can read the entry if you like. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. <laughs> but why on earth did you break it off? What had I done? I had done nothing. Cecily, I am very much hurt indeed to hear that you broke it off, particularly when the weather was so charming. <laughs> it would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off, at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. <laughs> You dear romantic boy. I hope your hair curls.
goes naturally. <laughs> Does it? Yes, darling, with a little help from others. <laughs> I'm so glad. You'll never break off the engagement again, will you, Cecily? Oh, I don't think I could break it off now that I've actually met you. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, of course, there is the question of your name. Yes, of course. <laughs> you mustn't laugh at me, darling. But it has always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. <laughs> there is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. <laughs> but, my own dear child, do you mean to say that you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Uh, any name you like. Algernon, for instance. <laughs> but I don't like the name Algernon. Well, my own dear, sweet, loving, little darling, I, I really can't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It, it is not at all a bad name. In fact, it is rather an aristocratic name. Half of the chaps who get into the bankruptcy court are called Algernon. But seriously, Cecily, <laughs> if my name was... Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character, but I fear I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. <coughs> Cecily, uh, your rector here is, I suppose, thoroughly experienced in the practice of all the rites and ceremonials of the church? Oh, yes. Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book. So you can imagine how much he knows. <laughs> <laughs> I must see him at once on a most important christening. I mean, on most important business. Oh! <laughs> I shan't be away more than half an hour. Well, considering that we have been engaged since February the 14th and that I have only just met you today for the first time, I think it's rather hard for you to leave me for so long a period as half an hour. <laughs> Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? <laughs> I shall be back in no time. What an impetuous boy he is! I like his hair so much. <laughs> I must enter his proposal in my diary. <laughs> Is there anyone here named Ernest? <laughs> <laughs> because you're a very popular person. You're welcome to be here. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. And of course, when there does come a moment, you'll be surprised to find out that both girls find out that their loved ones are not named Ernest. So you'll have to come and see the play to see what happens. <laughs> so, what's that make you think of? <laughs> There's so many things. I'm so in love with you people. Um, uh, one of the things that, uh, I mean, just to, to, to watch this, the skill of which this is being performed, one of the things that I talked about with uh, my intro students was this idea of sincerity on the stage and earnestness, and that when they're performing comedy, um, it's not funny to them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's funny to the audience, but for them, it's, oh, it's terribly real. Um, and so I really appreciated uh, the embodiment of earnestness in that scene, for sure. And the, the other thing that, that I really noticed, um, particularly in, in your rendition of Cecily, that um, you're so in charge in this scene, despite the fact that he keeps trying to <laughs> take control and diminish you in these terms of calling you a child and my little Cecily. and. Um, you're just having none of it, <laughs> right? I mean, you're, oh, she's so in control. I love it. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I find interesting about this play is the way that its relevance keeps popping up again and again um, over the past uh, more than 100 years now. 
um, because, of course, um, at the time that Wilde wrote this play, it was possible to have a personality in town and have a different personality in the country. Um, but that possibility kind of seemed to fall by the wayside a little bit as information technology began to sort of take off. But now with the internet, it's again possible to have multiple <laughs> identities. And so it becomes really interesting to think about this play as one that is continually fresh, refreshing itself um, and to try to update it a little bit in terms of what this would look like now, what would the importance of Ernest look like now. And it actually probably wouldn't look necessarily all that different. Mm -hmm. The conversations could be very similar it's just maybe the medium would be slightly different anyway. now that's really fascinating a thought about how you really can now pose yeah. as somebody yeah. completely different in yeah. all the uh, virtual worlds that you can play mm -hmm. in right mm -hmm. interesting yeah. yes <laughs> yeah we really um, uh, and we we talked um, in rehearsal quite a bit about you know what the rituals were about about courtship you mm -hmm. know and how it was important that marriages were um, done in certain ways and often not at all about who's in love with anybody, right? And so the idea that in this story, Oscar Wilde, you know, love wins, right? The people who are in love actually end up being able to, to fulfill that, that romantic ideal, but it wasn't really so often uh, in that particular strata of society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the other things that you see in this scene is um, Wilde as a writer making a commentary on writing. Mm -hmm. um, with yeah. Cecily and the diary and the way that she constructs this perfectly adventurous life for herself that she um, is unable to lead for herself and uh, that there's a kind of uh, meta-theatricality around writing in this that you, that you get to see writing stage and that gives us maybe a little insight into Oscar Wilde himself and the mm -hmm. way that he had to um, hide himself in his writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did, yeah. And actually, when he was put on trial, they brought many of his books in and used those as evidence against them, even though, of course, he wasn't writing by autobiography. Um, but I think that he was commenting on autobiography in the, when he's talking, when we see that scene with Cecily's diary, uh, because in part, um, one of the things that was happening at the end of the, at the 20th century is that people were starting to ask the questions about how well people actually remember things. This was with the rise mm -hmm. of experimental psychology and people were starting to test memories and finding that ordinary human memory sometimes has blips. It doesn't always record the past perfectly. And so the role of autobiography was becoming increasingly important and also under fire in a lot of ways. Like how well did these things actually happen or did you mis remember them and write them down? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like this is a really, it's a really rich scene mm -hmm. in terms of the fact that she's writing it down as it is happening so that nothing, she forgets nothing, so that nothing changes. Um, it shows this deep distrust of her own memory, her ability to retain all of her experiences. And isn't there a parallel now, too, right? Absolutely. We're, the, we're in the real time. In we're real recording time. things. We're texting about it. We're doing whatever to, to have sort of that exactly. record in the moment. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You have to be blogging while you're, while you're, while you're bungee jumping. So how, how does it affect your experience <laughs> of the moment that you're yeah. recording it at the same time that you're having that experience? It's yeah. an interesting question for us even today, right? Absolutely. And of course, well, it, there's a specific reference to that as well in an earlier scene with between Cecily and her governess, yes. where her governess says you shouldn't, you, you know, you shouldn't be writing in your diary, and she says this is where I record things, and the governess says, but memory is the diary, exactly. and she's like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's a direct uh, reference to that. Mm -hmm. Well, it yeah. has it has such um, believability in this world. Uh, Algernon takes it as utter truth. <laughs> oh, please tell me what what happened, <laughs> right? He, I mean, he didn't experience this, but he believes her. Yeah. Why? He why, goes with why it. did this happen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We also, I would say, one of the interesting challenges for us um, um, in, in performing it, and that we're continuing to work on, of course, um, has to do with making sure that we think about it um, without imposing a contemporary sensibility about it, you know, uh, without having a judgment about it, is that, um, or, or comment on it from, uh, from the perspective of where we are at this time and place, but to just take it, you know, use the language and just take it in that moment and try to experience it the way uh, Oscar Wilde wrote it. And, and uh, sometimes I think um, if there's any pitfalls maybe to performing this play uh, for folk, that might be it, mm -hmm. to be able to, um, to not um, impose what we already know and understand about people. Let's uh, um, 
further down a certain line than what was happening in 1895 and look at it with uh, old eyes instead of contemporary eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have, any, have either of you ever had any um, uh, 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 experience with the production? You've taught it in, in class? Just taught it in class. And, and <laughs> I always switch the gender roles on my students. So oh, I yeah, have, oh, I, yeah. Yeah, like you said, the lady, the, the, the biggest football player plays right. Lady, lady Bracknell, Bracknell. <laughs> always. Uh, <laughs> and, and, the, and the other big football player plays Little Cecily. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I don't think it's I've fun, ever, I've it? never seen it actually produced. Oh, so you're in film I have but. seen um, the Cecily Gwendolyn scene in I, I just maybe 30 times in say, various acting classes. Sure it's a popular. perennial favorite. <laughs> when they compare diaries. Yeah, but it's, I mean, uh -huh. it's, it's one of those plays that does work so well in the classroom, on the stage. Um, I really wanted to bring part of that scene today, too, but mm. time was an issue. Mm -hmm. But yeah, mm -hmm. when the, once the girls get together and find out that they're each engaged to Ernest, <laughs> yeah. it's quite fun. <laughs> All right, we have time for a few questions from the house, but you have to be brave and speak up loud. So is there anything, any, any topic, or would you like to ask an actor a question, or is there anything at all that we can address that you're interested in? I see a hand over there. Hey, speak up. That's a good question. Um, it's it's sort of a, a, a long story, um, but because he but was but a good one. <laughs> he was he was. He, uh, the question is why was Oscar Wilde in prison so late in his life? Yes, um, he was um, pretty openly homosexual during his life, um, and but and he but he was married with two children, um, but he got he uh, entered into a, an affair with. Um, a, a young man whose father then sued him for uh, homosexuality and uh, or tr brought him to court and he then sued the father for libel um, and he lost that case and in losing that case he was also simultaneously convicted for homosexuality and sent to prison for two years he did hard labor for two years and that was why when he emerged he was um, he was an outcast in London society because everybody had known but in a an implicit way that he was a homosexual and it wasn't until he was actually dragged in front of the courts it was all over the newspapers and he was able, not able to find any any doors open to him in London and that was why he had to go to Paris and why he died in poverty there it's a really interesting story because when uh, Alfred's father sued uh, uh, charged him with homosexuality if he had not sued yeah. for libel about something that was true um, it probably wouldn't have happened that way. They but, wouldn't have um, brought it to court. Yeah, because it was it forced it into court. Yeah, because it was impossible to prove, and so they were not going to take up the case. But because then he sued for libel and he lost that case, they were able to prove that because I think the the to burden prove of the proof libel, yeah. was, is different, but, mm -hmm. and it's so a, he lost. It's a story that's also been played out on the stage. Um, I believe it was the Tectonic Theater Company that mm -hmm. did a production called Gross Indecency. Mm -hmm. um, that was. Uh, mm -hmm that was about the whole incident, um, and they uh, took quite uh, good renown. Yeah. Yes, it was a very interesting story at the time. Gross Indecency, The Three Trials of Oscar Wilde. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's very interesting. Good question. What else? Anybody else have a question for us, or the uh, panelists or actors? Yes, ma'am. That's, that's a really good point because I think that Oscar Wilde was playing with the genre of autobiography and memoir at that point because he was talking about the problems with memory that exist, that people were rapidly becoming aware of about how normal human memory doesn't always behave the way we want it to, but at the same time he was making fun of the way that literary production happens. And like the, mm -hmm. the, the comment that she makes is like, oh, it's just a young girl's thoughts and, and hopes and consequently meant for publication. So he's making fun <laughs> of the literary 
literary marketplace <laughs> and the way that these autobiographies are produced while simultaneously making a perhaps more serious comment about how the human memory works. Yes, and you're absolutely right. They are in love with the men named Ernest. Um, there does come a point at the, at the end of the play where Lady Bracknell challenges Cecily's uh, uh, um, uh, worthiness of being married having to do with social status. And at that point, Algernon says he doesn't care about her social status, he just loves her. And then, of course, they find out she's rich. So really, it's a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Anybody else have a question you'd like to ask? As I said that in a British dialect, sorry. <laughs> it's catching. I can't help it. All right. Well, we actually have some tickets, I believe. Here comes marketing director for Tennessee Repertory Theater, Pat Patrick. Woohoo!